Okay, members, please take your seats. Uh, we move on to questions to the Minister for Communities, and I call on Doug Beatty. Call the Minister. Thank yeah, thanks very much, Concolier, and thank you to the member um, for this important question. And I suppose as a society which understands the past is stronger for the future, it is therefore important to me that my department helps communities to enjoy and realise the value of our historic environment. My department's relevant powers and responsibilities are set out in two pieces of legislation, the Historic Monuments and Archaeological Objects Order 1995 and the Planning Act 2011. Under the legislation, my department has a duty to maintain 190 state care monuments and to facilitate access where possible. My department is responsible for compiling a schedule of historic monuments, and there are currently approximately 2,000 of those scheduled monuments. Scheduling provides additional protection through the requirement for uh, scheduled monument consent before carrying out any alterations to these monuments. And my department is responsible for drawing up a list um, of buildings of special architectural or historical interest. And we are currently have around 8,900 listed buildings. Alterations without listed building consent are an offence. My department must be consulted by planning authorities on applications that affect listed buildings and historic monuments, and on draft local development plans also, and I'll be engaging with councils in the time ahead around those local development plans as they progress. My department also has special powers regarding um, enforcement action for unregulated work to protected places and buildings, and to fund activities um, related to the historic environment. In the use of its powers, my department seeks to work closely with relevant communities and stakeholders to ensure that we strive to hand down to the next generation the rich heritage of which we have inherited. Doug Beatty, supplementary. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and, and thank you, Minister, for uh, a comprehensive answer. Um, and if you can bear with me on this one, please. Knock IV is a reasonably important prehistoric burial site just outside Ruff Island dating back to 3500 BC. Uh, it was later used as an inauguration site uh, for early medieval Irish kings and is scheduled for protection under the Historic Monument and Archaeological Objects Order 1995. Since 2013, the Historical Environments Division, one of yours, uh, have failed to protect this site, allowing significant development to take place. Uh, and if it wasn't for the Friends of Knock Ivy, um, our heritage on that site would now be destroyed. Therefore, can I ask the Minister what action she is going to take to fix the government-sponsored vandalism of Knock Ivy that doesn't leave the ratepayers of Armagh, Bambridge and Craigavon out of pocket due to her department's failures? Thanks very much um, for your supplementary. And I suppose I, mean, I do commend those organisations and campaign groups on the ground at a grassroots level um, that work to protect our heritage and our environment as well. And I am aware of the Knock AV um, issue. Obviously, in 2017, a telephone mass was erected. Uh, my department consulted the council, and I know there was successful enforcement action that happened. Obviously, there's ongoing issues around the wind turbine, which was also erected in 2017. And this was from a previous plan and permission from the Department of the Environment at that time dating back to 2013, in which my department were not consulted on. And obviously, since then, uh, planning powers have transferred to local authorities. My department, when I have engaged with them this week, um, are keen. We have been having an ongoing engagement with the local council in terms of looking at this issue and the planning that was granted. And I will continue to do that while also uh, liaising with the Department of Infrastructure around the impacts that this is having um, on that historical site in the time ahead. So I do give a commitment to you. I'm happy to sit down and engage with you, um, also to meet with the group um, on, at the community level um, to see if we can get a resolution um, in terms of taking this matter forward. I call Kelly Armstrong. Bigger. Um, I wish to ask the Minister, um, when I was in contact with her um, department while this place was not sitting, they stated that they didn't have enough resources to adequately protect and take preventative actions um, against historic sites like the one in my constituency, Kirkcabin Harbour, for being destroyed through lack of upkeep. So I'd like to ask the Minister, 
what action that she will take to resource her department so that they can take legal action to require private owners to fulfil their responsibility to look after such sites. Thanks very much uh, for your question. I suppose currently there are a number of funding streams uh, which are in place since 2016, particularly around um, historic environments, and one is the Historic Environment Fund. And we do fund over 800,000 per year um, in terms of looking at uh, those issues. Whilst I do recognise that there are constraints, some of that is because of austerity and the impact on budgets. Um, within my department, where just under 300 million has been taken out of the department over the last five years, and I do think there's a broader conversation within the executive um, in terms of looking at the block grant, looking at austerity and the impact that it has. But I do give a commitment that I'm looking at all of these in terms of the budget setting process going forward, ensuring that we have the necessary resources in place, but also ensuring that those most in need are prioritised as well. So again, to the member, if there are specifics that you would like to raise with me, I'm more than happy to meet and provide follow-up information. Before I call the next question, I'd like to make the point that questions 7 and 12 have both been withdrawn. John Bunting. Your question two, please. Thanks very much to the member um, for this question, which is um, a crucial area and one that obviously from I've come into post three weeks ago has been high up on my agenda, obviously from other members of this chamber who have been raising concerns, but also those groups that work at the coal face um, of this issue. So I do want to thank you for raising the question and what is a serious problem for people who are claiming universal uh, credit for the first time. I suppose when the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was here a few weeks ago when the institutions were re-established, I made it clear to him that welfare reform uh, was hurting many of our people, and particularly the most uh, vulnerable within our society. And I reiterated to the Prime Minister that austerity and that the attack of welfare changes was punishing poor people for being poor. Um, and I think that that's playing out, not just here, but also we're looking at the consequences of that um, approach in England and Scotland and in Wales as well, where the poorest people are suffering. Each week, approximately 860 new claims for universal credit become uh, due to their first payment, with 95% of these paid at the end of the first five-week period. And whilst I am pleased that my staff are able to make sure that most people get their first payment when it is due, I do not believe that it is right uh, to make people wait this long in the first instance, so there is a critical factor that needs to be addressed. I believe that waiting five weeks for the first payment is wrong, and I think that's clearly that I need to state that. And it also creates real hardship for families, forcing many into debt and having to use food banks. And again, we're hearing those stories on a daily basis. I suppose ultimately I want to deliver a welfare system that is compassionate and that sits with the new decade, new approach deal, where we're saying that we want to have politics that is different and politics was, which is compassionate and which looks after the most vulnerable and protects the most vulnerable. And a system that is based on objective need to ensure that those who need it uh, get, get it. And also my approach is to embed a rights-based approach to look at the issue of human rights, embedding human rights within the department and looking at issues of social security, but also looking at the issue of dignity. And as I've engaged with a number of welfare groups and campaigners over the last couple of weeks, they have been some of the key points around how people's dignity is stripped from them when they go through these processes and the impact of universal credit. And I think it's something collectively that we need to deal with in the time ahead. We do already have a range of flexibilities and mitigations agreed in the previous executive that are helping to offset some of the worst aspects of welfare reform here. And one of these is the Universal Credit Contingency Fund, a fund which is unique to here. And I know that other places like England and, and Wales are really looking to the mitigations that we were able to secure here because they are having an impact, albeit I recognise it doesn't go far enough. It is available to anyone who is making a claim for universal credit and who is experiencing hardship. And that fund to date has paid out over 1.5 million and has impacted on 7,500 lives. Just to end in the time ahead, there are serious issues with universal credit. I am giving a commitment to the Human Rights Commission 
Professor Eileen Avison, who led on the first round of mitigations, and indeed the Cliff Edge Coalition, that I want to seriously look at this issue in the time ahead. I also want to engage with members on this issue to look at what further progress and mitigations we can make as we move forward on this issue. Could I just remind people, including the Minister, that there is a time limit for contributions? Thank you. Joanne, uh, Ponting, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for a very detailed answer. The Minister will know that often the delays extend to three months, um, which in some cases can see clients facing eviction uh, from their homes on top of all their other financial pressures. So firstly, what does she plan to do to streamline the process? And also to ask her if she will implement a repayment plan for those who have availed of, advance, of an advanced payment. The entire repayment of this loan is being taken from the client's initial universal credit payment, um, which often results in extended hardship, and it takes clients then longer to stabilise their finances. So will the Minister give consideration to implementing a repayment plan for that as well? Minister, yeah. yeah. I think, yes, there, there are the issues that I'm going to be looking at over the coming weeks. Obviously, there are repayments up to 12 months in terms of the advance payment. That can be extended to 15 months under exceptional circumstances. From October 2021, that will extend to 16 months. But we can be doing more, um, and I think it's engaging with those at the grassroots who have been impacted by this to look at what we can do as a department in order to make protections, to look at changes that we can bring in around this issue. So I commit that I will be doing that, and I'll be announcing plans in the coming weeks as to how I take that forward. Mark Durgan. Uh, Sean Corlea, thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank the Minister for her answers thus far and congratulate her on her post. I haven't uh, addressed her since. The Minister, in her first answer, mentioned, among other things, food banks. Could the Minister or would the Minister be able to inform the House, since parties, some parties here voted to introduce welfare reform and universal credit, how many food banks have opened here and how many people have been forced to access those food banks for vital support? I don't have the exact numbers of our own food banks, but I can follow that up um, after. And obviously, the issue I touched on it earlier in terms of the welfare agenda, in terms of making cuts, I believe was ideologically driven by the Tory government. Um, in terms of that, we don't operate under our own fiscal powers, and we're determined by a block grant that is given. And people will remember back in 2016 when this issue was on the agenda that there were threats and there were actually penalties to that block grant that was taken on a regular basis because there was no agreement around this. We do have the mitigations in place, and obviously I made an announcement today, which I'll speak to you on a further question, around extending those mitigations. But I will be also be engaging with food banks to see if the intelligence from those who go into those services, what more can we be doing to protect people are there further mitigations that we can be looking at? Are there fundamentally changes within the welfare and social security system that we need to do? Again, this is about protecting the most vulnerable. It's about prioritising those in greatest need. And that's something that I will be laying out in the time ahead. But importantly, engaging with the sector on the ground that are working with those people and talking to people who have been directly impacted. I call Andy Allen. I'm sure as constituency MLAs we've all seen the impact of welfare reform and indeed universal credit right across our respective constituencies. Can the Minister advise if she is confident that the IT, IT infrastructure for universal credit is suitably efficient in order to deal with the amount of claims coming through and will it be able to uh, deal with the capacity of claims when universal credit is fully rolled out across Northern Ireland in respect of uh, new claimants and those on legacy benefits. Thank you um, for your question. And I suppose this is an issue that I first raised when I went into the department. Obviously, we haven't seen the full rollout of universal credit, and there's been the pilot, obviously, in England that we've been looking at closely. Obviously, we need to ensure that we have the IT systems in place, and particularly where we want to mitigate and protect against um, the, the worst excesses of the austerity agenda. Um, I have asked the officials to look at what additional measures we need to bring in and to ensure that that is costed up, so I will be providing that information in the time ahead. And I know this is a keen interest for the member in terms of the questions that you have sent, so I am more than happy to sit down with you in the time ahead um, as I move forward with new proposals, just to speak to you in terms of seeking um, your advice 
your recommendations and I suppose the experiences of the claimants that come into your office. I'm keen to sit down and have a chat with you also. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's great to hear the Minister saying that um, she will be making announcements in, in the near future about any potential changes that she can make to this awful process that we, that we now have. Um, and I would like to maybe ask, I know that an announcement will be forthcoming, she said, but will, does the Minister have powers to make changes, for example, for people who do make claims for universal credit and who are um, suffering life limiting or terminal diagnosis such as cancer uh, and people that I'm working with for example who have been forced through this process um, and um, having to sorry still getting turned down and having to appeal that as well for over two years well does she have the power for example to not force that upon these these people anymore I suppose just the the group that you've mentioned there uh, member and thank you for your question I'm actually doing a meeting this week um, with a number of people who have been impacted, I suppose, by the cruel policy of the six-month rule, and it's something that I will be looking at in the time ahead. Obviously, all of this is subject in terms of budgets because we don't get the additional money um, through the block grant, and that's something that I want to look at in the time ahead in terms of looking at further mitigations that we can mitigate um, to protect the most vulnerable. So I will be outlining my plans as I go forward, but importantly, looking at co-design with the sector, the community and voluntary sector, with the advice sector, but importantly also with those who have been directly impacted, the people on the ground who are receiving um, the social security protections. I want to listen to them in the time ahead to move to what else we can be doing. It's not always a financial solution, obviously money is one part of it, but we could be making fundamental changes to the system itself that makes it easier for people to access and also to receive the support when they need it. So I'll be looking at this issue in the coming weeks. I call Keith Archibald. Gormaga, can call you question three. Question three. Just thank you um, to the member again for your question. And I suppose the executive policy of integrating social considerations into contracts defines public sector commitments to incorporate social clauses within public procurement. The bi-social model has been operated by the Strategic Investment Board since 2016 and has proven an effective means of providing targeted recruitment and training opportunities for long-term unemployed people, apprentices and students. Social clauses are intended to provide genuine, sustainable training and employment opportunities and are not to be seen as a source of low-cost labour. I am committed to the promotion of the bi-social model to incorporate social clauses into construction and services contracts according to the relevant thresholds as set out in the procurement guidance. I know that I will also be doing other work cross-departmentally around the Social Value Act, and I think this is also an important piece of work, and indeed also my own experience working within local government, looking at local government strategies around inclusive growth. I think it's a critical point as we move forward that contracts can't just be looked at in terms of low cost. We need to look at the impact it has on social value, on target and objective need, and also looking at issues around how we change the culture and how we use public procurement and contracts to do that on issues such as a living wage, where we do mark up those employers who are living wage employers to try and create a more just economic model and system. Archibald for supplementary. Thank the Minister for her response and I think we all recognise the immense benefit there is from local and social clauses and I welcome that, that she is um, working cross departmentally on the Social Value Act. Um, can she also outline if she will ensure that the department follows international best practice in relation to maximising the impact of social clauses? Thank you. Yes, I will be looking at those best practices and taking those forward in the time ahead. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister also for her answers thus far. Um, we have had social clauses under various ministers in uh, what was DSD then over, over many years, and those social clauses on many occasions were not fit for purpose and did not have the real value that they intended to be. Um, could I ask the Minister in going forward if she can um, uh, talk to uh, the Minister of Economy going forward, looking at those skills and trades um, with, that are not only going to help our communities in the next few years, but for many years to come, to build capacity amongst those communities in those various skills and trades? 
Again, just to thank the member for an important point. I've actually written to the Minister um, for the Economy just to pick up on a number of these issues. So I'm hoping um, that we'll be meeting in the coming weeks. Um, and this is one of the issues around also the skills and employability agenda that, I'll, that we'll be discussing in the time ahead. So hopefully we can move forward on these issues cross-departmentally. Her place and wish her well. Um, she and I both served in Belfast City Council and she knows the experience there with social clauses was not a universally positive one. People point to the skyline of Belfast and its expansion as a sign of the progress we're making and that's true. But does the Minister agree with me that it's essential that inner city communities such as the market, Sandy Road, Donegal Pass, the village at Donegal Road, see the benefit of major government contracts and it simply isn't? In ter measured in terms of extra buildings going up, and that social clauses properly implemented will be a useful way of ensuring that those communities see the benefits of major infrastructure projects. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly um, with the member, and thank you for your question. I mean, it should be about the social value that's added, but particularly around target and objective need. So I would fully agree with that, um, and that's something that I'll be looking closely at in the time ahead. I call Michelle McElveen. For Mr. Speaker. So just thanks very much um, to the member just for your question. And I acknowledge and appreciate the great work uh, which Libraries NI delivers on behalf of my department across a network um, which includes 96 libraries, 16 mobile libraries and a home call service. Libraries NI contributes to the well-being right across the community through their health, education and other extended programmes. Unfortunately, due to continued budget cuts over previous years, not all libraries uh, provided late night opening over the summer period in July and August. Some smaller libraries closed for a week during the summer period. 14 larger libraries reduced their opening hours over the Christmas period from December 23rd until the 31st. The remaining 82 libraries closed over the Christmas period from the 23rd of December until the 1st of January inclusive. In all cases, Libraries NI have tried to minimise the impact on services to those local communities. Recent innovations include the introduction of Lego clubs in the majority of libraries to encourage a wide range of users, such as fathers and their children. This initiative aims to promote social engagement, help deliver uh, motor skills and improve communication skill and nurture individuals' self-esteem through collaboration and creative thinking. Other programmes deliver include rhythm and rhyme sessions for parents and children in every library, knit and natter and tea and newspaper activities which promote social inclusion, particularly for older people. Libraries NI also offer to support uh, for people seeking employment to find jobs and prepare for curriculum uh, VAT and also make online applications through the internet access and Wi-Fi, which are both offered free um, to the public. Whilst I appreciate uh, that due to budget cuts, some libraries have reduced their opening hours, they do continue to deliver uh, real valuable services across the whole community. And it's an area that I'm keen to engage on in the time ahead. Michelle McElveen, supplementary. Okay, I'd like to thank the Minister for her response, and, and I very much appreciate the great service that Libraries and I do provide, despite um, the challenging finances. I also welcome the cross-departmental work to provide the, the pilot out of our service, particularly in my own constituency in Sainfield. But could the Minister give an update on the much-anticipated and long-overdue redevelopment of the Newton Arts Library, please? I don't have, we have asked, I've asked for a breakdown um, of all of the current programmes to do with libraries, so I'll follow that up in a written question to you. Thank you. Uh, I call Orlia Flynn. Question five. Thank you um, for uh, your question. And I suppose from the outset it is to set out that um, as an individual, as an MLA, and indeed as a minister, I am opposed to austerity. Um, that will come as no surprise to anyone. And I do believe in compassion and human rights for all of our people. And indeed, these are things that are embedded not just within the Good Friday Agreement, but also in the new decade, new approach. All decisions which I make will be based on objective evidence and need. And therefore, I welcome this question that provides an opportunity for me to set my stall out. 
I announced this morning um, that the executive agreed to my recommendation in line with the new decade new approach for the urgent extension of the bedroom tax mitigation beyond March 2020. The mitigation scheme currently provides financial support to people who have otherwise would have lost out due to welfare cuts. And this is an estimated 38,000 households or families that are in receipt of the supplementary payments which protects them from the bedroom tax. In the coming weeks, I will introduce legislation to extend the essential mitigation, which will continue to safeguard more than 38,000 of the most vulnerable households within our society from the harsh uh, welfare cuts that we have seen. This proposal will cost £23 million per annum. And indeed, aligned to that, over the coming weeks, I'm going to bring forward regulations around the other strands of the existing welfare mitigations, such as areas around the benefit cap and also those transitioning from DLA to PIP. And indeed, the cost of that, again, is around £17.3 million uh, per annum. However, there are also other mitigations which need to be looked at, um, and we need to review the mitigation measures we committed to within the new decade new approach. I will continue to liaise with stakeholders and work with them around co-design, around how we move this necessary work forward. And I just, suppose just want to acknowledge and thank the organisations that I have met in the last few weeks, and I have prioritised this Could area of work. the Minister to conclude her remarks, please? The Human Rights Commission, Cliff Edge Coalition, and Advice NI, to name but a few. Caller Leah Flynn for supplementary. Um, I'd like to thank the Minister for her response. Um, could the Minister ensure that the advice sector is adequately resourced so that those who are dependent on welfare benefits um, will receive their full entitlement? Well, just on that, in terms of the mitigation payments, um, I have um, asked, and part of the regulations and the payments going forward, is to continue the vital uh, funding to the advice sector that they have been receiving on an annual basis, because it is critical that we do have the advice there for people who are in crisis that they can turn to. Um, and also, I have to say, even within the department and then the local jobs and benefit offices, there are skilled staff there, and I would encourage any member that finds someone who is in need to access either the independent advice or to go through the local jobs and benefit offices. But I am keen to ensure that that uh, resource for the advice sector is retained. I call Mervyn's story. I welcome the Minister's comments in relation to social science criteria. It will be novel to see the party opposite actually vote this time for regulations as the last time they left that responsibility to the House of Commons. Can the Minister give a, an assurance that the underspend of, for at least two years of £136 million in relation to the mitigation measures is still in place, is still money that is available? And what is she going to do in the Department to ensure that there is not a further drain on public finances, but the money that was allocated will likely be used? Well, it's an area that I'm looking at currently. Obviously, the last round of mitigations, which were secured, which re really played a vital role in protecting the most vulnerable. Obviously, they were um, developed over a very short uh, time period of around five weeks and then introduced. There were some elements of that when you looked at it um, that the tax system would have taken some of that money if we had to pay it out. So, and in fact, it wasn't actually going to protect the most vulnerable. In announcements that I'm going to make in the coming weeks, it is around working with the sector, working with people who have been impacted around any future mitigations that we want to bring forward, is to really test what works well, really test um, and develop mitigations that protect uh, the most vulnerable and the larger amount of people within our society as well. And I will be rolling out my plans and my approach to that in the coming weeks. Thank Jerry Carroll. Given today's announcement that the bedroom tax mitigations will be extended, I want to ask the Minister what she intends to do to help those who have already lost their supplementary payments uh, when they move to a house with the same amount of rooms uh, because it suited their outstanding needs. For example, people who had to move to a different accommodation uh, to make sure it suited and it could accommodate uh, their disabilities. What would she do to ensure those people who have lost out their supplementary payments will be supported? Thanks for your question. This is a critical area, one which I was um, acutely aware of, and I have closed that loophole within the system. And therefore, any change of circumstances around moving will now be uh, mitigated for within the new proposals going forward. 
That ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could the Minister explain to the House why one of the first decisions she took upon becoming Communities Minister for Northern Ireland was to do away with the long-standing custom and practice of publishing the names of those legally convicted of benefit fraud in Northern Ireland? Thank you for your question. Um, and I suppose the first thing, it hasn't been long-standing custom and practice. This actually was only introduced again back in 2011. So from 2007 up until that period, this custom and practice didn't um, exist. And I suppose for me, names that are published in terms of benefit fraud, which is a serious issue and which my department puts a large resource into, those names are already published within the system that adjudicates on those issues, and that's within the court and criminal justice system, and I feel that that's where it should rest. When I have been engaging with the rights sector over the last couple of weeks, they do feel that this creates um, a, an, hour, an hour of demonisation of poor families, and that's something that I wanted to ensure that we mitigate against. And when you look at the Social Security budget, £6.1 billion, less than 1% of that is around benefit fraud. I want to focus more on the Make the Call campaign, where in the year 1819 we actually secured 43.1 million of additional benefits that people were entitled to and they hadn't claimed, and also looking at issues of official errors and how we can reduce that, because in the same year the adjustments were 22.5 million, which in many ways outstrip uh, the issue around benefit fraud. I think that's where my focus needs to be. I'm about protecting the most vulnerable, ensuring that people get the access to the social security system that they should. That's notwithstanding the benefit fraud work that still goes on. But I don't see the need for me to publish uh, those on my website. They are already done through the court service. Jonathan Buckley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I recognise what the Minister has, say, has said. But does she realise that this has left many law-abiding citizens Asking the question, the question in which I put to the Minister now, where does this Minister and her department stand in relation to criminality and transparency? Well, I've set that out very clearly. We have a resource that looks at issues of benefit fraud and they are prosecuted and the figures stand for themselves. But I would also ask the member back then, when you start asking questions around where uh, NAMA in terms of the property portfolio, where there were billions wasted, when we look at tax avoiders, um, and those they aren't listed on a system. When we start to look at all of those issues, and when you look at the money, this is less than one percent of a 5.6 or 5.1 uh, billion pound budget. It's an issue of proportionality, and I don't think it is proportionate to look at the most vulnerable. We need to be looking at those who actually, in terms of tax avoidance, where well, you're talking billions upon billions that are in offshore accounts in the Cayman Islands. That's where our focus should be, and it should be proportionate. I call Carol Nicholin. Well, I was going to ask a minister a similar question, so I just want to elaborate on that uh, with your indulgence. Um, the minister outlined the rationale for stopping the publication of the names of people convicted for benefit fraud, and she also gave her response as to why. Um, could she also elaborate, if possible, um, you know, when people are convicted of fraud of other benefits, how many times are their names published? Is it once, twice, three or four times? particularly for uh, uh, benefits or, indeed, convictions at times for small amounts of money. Minister. I, don't have, I just have some of the figures in terms of the number of convictions for benefit fraud over the last number of years, and obviously it's been a figure that has declined in recent years, so 16, 17, 280, 17, 18, 316, there was a slight increase, and then 18, 19, 191. But I'll get the rest of that information in written form and send it to you. I appreciate the, the Minister's response, and perhaps could you also, just for the purposes of clarity, also try and get some figures in terms of error? Because we often hear about fraud, we very rarely hear about the error within the system, and errors that we heard in previous questions, I think Joanne Bunty asked it, particularly in relation to universal credit, and the impact, the human impact that has on people, it would be good to have those figures also. I think just on the error one, an official figure um, just recently in terms of adjustments was £22.5 million. Pounds. So it's not a small budget, um, and it's something when you're looking at the fraud figures, it's £56.2 million. 
but when you're also looking at those who aren't getting the benefits that they're entitled to, it's 43.1 million. So my focus is around reducing the error, but also ensuring that that make the call line, those who are entitled to the unclaimed benefits, actually receive them. I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I uh, welcome the use of the sign language interpreter uh, here in question time today? Uh, on, on that topic, uh, could I ask the Minister to give an update on plans to introduce a uh, sign language bill here to the Assembly? Thank you very much. And I suppose I have to thank a member of the House um, who raised the issue of the signer and obviously also the Concolier as well. And I think it is good and it's something that we should definitely use in the time ahead. Obviously, I am aware of the um, British and Irish uh, sign language uh, framework being put in place. There's obviously been um, ongoing work around that. I'm meeting with departmental officials again um, this week in terms of looking at a timeline to bring that legislation forward. So that will start to develop over the coming weeks and months. And I'll update the committee and also this chamber once I have a more um, definitive timeline. Mr. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her positive response? And I think it does lead as a good example in going forward. Uh, will the Minister ensure that um, in any discussions that the entire executive and all departments will be kept on board as this bill uh, progresses to ensure that it is right across the board and that everybody's bought into it? Yes, I can give a commitment that I'll do that. Fran McCann. Uh, can I ask the Minister for Communities? If our department is working to ensure the, neighbor, the neighbourhood renewal budget for this year uh, for the community and vanity sector will be in place to ensure continuity of service. Thanks very much, Member, uh, for your question. I have done an initial meeting on the neighbourhood renewal programme and budget. Obviously, as someone who was previously employed under that programme and also lives in a community that is impacted by it, I do see um, the amazing work that neighbourhood renewal partnerships do. Um, I am obviously we're in the middle of budget setting processes, but it is to ensure that the budget as is will not reduce in any way. But I will have to look at how we develop that programme in the time ahead, and importantly, how the neighbourhood renewal programme in the future starts to bed into the anti-poverty strategy that I'll be bringing forward to this chamber. Supplementary from McCann. Um, as the minister is aware, for the past number of years, the community and family sector have had the issue protected notices uh, to its workforce because of uncertainty of budget allocation. Can the minister assure us that this yearly disaster, which has a huge, huge impact on the community infrastructure, <coughs> is dealt with urgently and our department moved to a three-year funding cycle as soon as possible? Again, thank you to the member for your supplementary. I think the issue of multi-annual budgeting um, is essential. I know it's within the new decade, new approach. There are obviously some system issues in terms of moving to that agenda. But it makes sense if you're working in the most deprived communities, you're trying to develop programmes. You can't do that in 12 months. And I do think we need to give a greater level of certainty and assurance to those projects that are working at the coal face. So I will be looking at that seriously in the time ahead, but also around the rights um, of those employed in the community and voluntary sector. We have seen as well in terms of they haven't had issues of a pay raise. There are other issues in terms of workers' rights. And again, that's something that I have already tasked my officials with compiling a report looking at those issues and how I, as a minister, can proactively address them, ensuring that workers' rights as well is at the heart of what we're trying to do. Question five has been withdrawn, and I call Sinead Annis. Good morning, uh, Can call you. Uh, in 2018, I launched the Fair Play for Ulster Gales campaign. The campaign was born out of the intense frustration from the GEA community across Ulster that the BBC, the broadcaster in which we all pay, pay our licence fee to, were not reflecting the popularity of Gaelic games in their TV and radio coverage. Can I ask the Minister if her department on behalf of the quarter of a million GEA members in Ulster, intend to work with the BBC and the GEA, including other stakeholders, to tackle the inequalities that exist in the coverage of Gaelic games by the BBC. Thanks very much for your question. Obviously, it is an issue that I am acutely aware of, um, and also the impact um, that the GAA, like other sports, has on our young people, on our communities and on society as a whole. I will be meeting um, as part of my portfolio with the BBC in the coming weeks, and it's one of the key issues I'm going to be raising with them. So again, I can uh, come back and update the member on that, but also this, this chamber as well. Sinead Annis for supplementary. 
I appreciate that, Minister. Um, by way of a supplementary, um, I'd like to bring to your attention, and members will be aware of the um, the absurdity um, of geoblocking, which we're all subject to uh, in the north here. And can I ask the minister, and perhaps um, uh, alongside the the minister for the economy as well, um, to look at that issue and perhaps work with RTE, um, the GA, and, and um, at your meeting with the BBC as well to try and tackle that issue also. Thank you. I'll give a commitment, just that I will raise that. Catherine Kelly. Minister, can you ensure that the housing waiting list and housing stress for OMA needs to have a town and rural dimension to ensure that rural dwellers in particular are not overlooked? Thanks very much for your question. And it will be an area that I'm looking at in the time ahead. I will be setting out my vision and approach in terms of looking at the issue of housing, whether that's the waiting list the social housing programme, and I suppose a key component will be that housing needs to be delivered on the basis of need um, and objective need in terms of where the greatest need is, and the housing programme needs to be aligned to that. I have asked for a geographical breakdown of those statistics, and I'll be meeting with officials again this week and next week as we firm up our housing approach and policy in the time ahead, and indeed I'll engage with the Minister directly on the specifics of your area. Supplementary, Catherine Kelly. I thank the Minister for her answer and I look forward to working with her and indeed for Manor and Oma Council to ensure that housing need is reflected throughout the local development plan process for that council area in the near future. When I mentioned it earlier that I will be engaging uh, with the 11 local authorities, particularly around the emergence of their local development plans, housing being a critical component. It's obviously also highlighted within the new decade, new approach deal, that we radically need to increase the amount of public housing that we're actually making available. And indeed, that has to be in the areas of greatest need. Local development plans need to be aligning to that as well, and particularly looking at access to public land. And it's my firm view that public land should be used for the greater public good. And one of the greatest public goods is the provision of housing. It's a, a basic fundamental human right and it's going to be a key focus for me and my department in the time ahead. question has been withdrawn. I call Palm Cameron. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if she is planning at all to review um, the housing stock in terms of emergency housing in the future? I will be looking at this in terms of the access um, and the availability of emerging housing stock, along with a number of key strands of uh, housing work, allocations obviously being another one. And I know we didn't get to those questions on the main, but I will be setting that out in the coming weeks in terms of what my approach and vision will be in the time ahead. So again, I'll follow that up with you. And once I make that announcement, there will be more information as well. Supplementary to Palm Cameron with the final two minutes in this session. Thank you, uh, Minister, for that response, and I welcome that uh, commitment. Um, I'm sure the Minister would agree with me that there, quite often uh, emergency co accommodation can be very unsuitable, highly unsuitable for certain individuals, and I'm thinking in terms of sometimes uh, young uh, females with young children, and maybe vulnerable adults and whatnot, and people affected by domestic violence. So uh, do welcome her commitment to look at this issue, but just to ask then, that, uh, does she agree with me that, that hostel accommodation in particular can be very unsuitable for some individuals? I think definitely it's a critical area. I spoke at the, the Women's Aid Conference last week around changing the conversations, and one of the critical areas was around housing was around security of tenure. Obviously, that's part of the allocations and the point system as well that I will be looking to address in the time ahead because issues of domestic violence is not listed as an area um, that's kind of pointed out in that. So I'm keen to review all of this in the time ahead and I suppose supporting those with complex needs. And that's where even at the Executive Away Day a couple of weeks ago, looking at the Department of Health, looking at the Department of Justice, we need to be working um, across the Executive uh, departments to ensure that we're providing the support and the resource to those who need it the most. So this will be a priority for me in the time ahead.